Today, we're going to cover the history of Ethiopia from the Solomonic Restoration in 1270 to the Age of Princes in 1769 AD. I'm Koloink History, and this video is part of a YouTube collaboration series on African history. In this video, we're going to cover the restoration of the Ethiopian monarchs claiming to be descendants of King Solomon, Ethiopia's harsh conflict with its Islamic neighbors, as well as the cultural and intellectual blossoming that occurred in the 17th and early 18th century. Stay tuned! In order to put this period in its historical context, a short background history is needed. The land that later would become Ethiopia, also referred to as Abyssinia, had been Christian since the 4th century, when the pre-Ethiopian kingdom known as Aksum converted to Christianity. The kingdom of Aksum came to dominate the Red Sea in late antiquity and the early Middle Ages, prospering from the trade with the Mediterranean. However, with the rise and spread of Islam, Aksum lost its control over the Red Sea. Becoming increasingly economically isolated, the kingdom started to decline to eventually be overthrown by the upcoming Sagwe dynasty, which ruled the remnants of the kingdom from the mid-11th to the late 13th century. Like the kings of Aksum, the Sagwe dynasty were Christians, and were very active in Ethiopian religious life constructing many new churches, and even attempting to construct a new Jerusalem. However, despite this, there were a lot of opposition to the Sagwes, and in 1270, the dynasty was overthrown by an Ethiopian nobleman called Yekoni Amalak. In order to avoid being seen as usurper, Yekoni claimed lineage to the older royal dynasties that predated the Sagwe dynasty, and also claimed that this lineage went all the way back to the biblical King Solomon. According to Ethiopian tradition, back in biblical times, the legendary Ethiopian Queen Sheba traveled to Israel, converted to the faith of King Solomon, and bore one of his children. Once having grown up, the child of Solomon is said to have returned to Ethiopia to rule as king, beginning a long line of Ethiopian kings, claiming direct descendants to King Solomon. By this way, Yekoni could legitimize his claim to the Ethiopian throne by claiming that he had restored an old biblical lineage and paint the Sagwe dynasty as a real usurpers. With a dynasty with a strong and legendary tradition behind them, together with the support of the church and social elites, the Ethiopian kingdom stood ready to face the impending struggles, both internally by regaining control over its lost provinces, as well as externally by encountering the forces of Islam in the east and south. In the early 14th century, the Ethiopian crown was passed to the warrior king Amda Seyon, who launched several successful conquests in all directions, capturing red seaports in the north, unclaimed regions in the west and south, as well as launching some successful campaigns to the east, defeating and taking large chunks of land from the Ifat Sultanate, which at the time was the dominant Islamic power in the region. The expansions by King Amda and his successors is likely to have made Ethiopia the largest it would be until the 19th century. In order to keep control over the conquered provinces, the kings established several local garrisons, as well as creating a system of fiefs called gults, in which the holder of a gult swore loyalty to the king in exchange for the right to rule a gult in the king's name, as well as being paid tribute by its inhabitants. The aggrandizement of non-Christian areas was accompanied by internal reforms and the solidation of the Christian state. The Ethiopian kingdom in the late medieval and early modern period was a Caesar papist state, which means that the Solomonic kings functioned as both the head of church as well as the head of the state. Most kings were very active in the development of the Ethiopian religious culture and discipline, by erecting many churches as well as repressing what they conceived to be local pagan practices. One peculiar aspect of the Ethiopian monarchy 
following the Salamonic restoration in the late medieval and early modern period, were that the kingdom had no capital city. Instead, the king and his court, together with the royal army and accompanying nobles, lived in tents and migrated between the provinces, only staying in an area for a couple of months and leaving after having exhausted the land or its residents, who were required to supply cattle, food and any other things that were demanded. The wars with Islamic powers on the African Horn did not end with the demise of the Ifta Sultanate, and after its fall the Muslim powers in the region came under the hegemony of the Adal Sultanate. The Sultan's ruling Adal had good contacts with the Ottomans and drilled their armies in Ottoman battle tactics. In the early 16th century, the Adal Sultan Ahmad ibn Ibrahim al Ghazi declared a holy war and invaded the Ethiopian kingdom. Unfamiliar with this new way of warfare, the Ethiopians were defeated as the forces of Adal entered the country, managing to conquer close to three quarters of the kingdom. However, the Ethiopians were not without help. In 1541, the Portuguese, whose interests in the Red Sea were imperiled by the region's Islamic powers, sent a group of 400 musketeers to train the Ethiopian soldiers in European battle tactics. With the help from the Portuguese, the Ethiopian kings managed to turn the tide against the forces of the Adal Sultanate, and in 1543, they managed to ambush and kill the Sultan, which resulted in his forces breaking down, leaving the occupied parts of Ethiopia to the Christians, who reclaimed the land. Despite having endured the conflict with Adal, the war had devastated the kingdom and left its political structure in shambles. On top of this were Ethiopia facing new problems from the south. Following the war with Adal, a pastoral people living in what today is southern Ethiopia, called the Oromo, started to migrate north, availing themselves of the collapse of the frontier defenses of both the Christian and Muslim states. By year 1600, the Oromo had spread so widely in Ethiopia that the Ethiopian kings had completely lost control over most of the realm and had to limit their power to the northern part of the kingdom. There they established a new capital at the city of Gondor, and from it the Solomonic kings gradually started to build up their wealth and power. Due to becoming Ethiopia's capital city, Gondor would have become a political, economical, as well as cultural hub in East Africa for much of the 17th and 18th centuries. The cultural blossoming during this time also saw the rise of several notable African Enlightenment philosophers, who mostly are unknown in the West, like Sarah Jacob and Walda Haywatt. From Gondor, the Ethiopian kings tried to consolidate their power over the kingdom. However, their attempts would be in vain. The country remained plagued by ethnical, regional, as well as religious factionalism that only seemed to be growing, and in 1769, the power of the Solomonic kings over Ethiopia completely collapsed, ushering in a century of feudal anarchy known as the Age of Princes which would last until the emergence of modern Ethiopia in the mid-19th century. That, however, is beyond the scope of this video. Today, I hope you learned something new about Ethiopian history as well as about African history in general. In case you haven't seen them yet, I strongly recommend that you go and check out Hikma History's video on the Almoravid's invasion of Al-Andalus, as well as the Casual Historian's video on the history of the Ethiopian Jews. Both videos can be accessed in the end screen.